stand with me for the reading of the gospel, please? Reading from gospel according to John. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Not to us, O Lord, be the glory, but to your name alone. Amen. Well, good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm honored to be invited. It's hard for me to believe that it's been 20 years since I was a graduate student at Wheaton College. It may look to you like it's been about 20 years, but it doesn't feel to me like it's been 20 years. It feels like just yesterday. Nonetheless, a lot has happened in that 20 years. A whole lot, in fact. 20 years ago, the internet did not exist. Today, it's the dominant social and economic force in the lives of millions, if not billions, of people. 20 years ago, cell phones, laptop computers, and wireless networks were virtually unheard of. Today, they are ubiquitous. 20 years ago, no one was talking about climate change. Today, it stands as one of the preeminent concerns of the international community. And 20 years ago, no one seriously considered the prospect of an African American in the White House. Yesterday, that dream became a reality. All of this points to the fact that we're living in an age of constant change, of daily advances in technology and communications and science and medicine, not to mention all the various applications resulting from those advances. And this change is mirrored in the multitude of social changes we see around us, changes in assumptions about gender and gender roles, about marriage and family, about work and leisure, about identity and community, the list goes on. Never has the human race been more globally aware and never has it been more globally transient. In short, this change is global and it's happening at an astonishing rate such that no matter which way we turn, we see it all around us. Call it post-modernity, call it what you will, change appears to be the only constant in our otherwise inconstant world. Now, many of these changes are good, at least in part. They can improve the length of our, and quality of our lives, the ease and accuracy of our labor, the speed and clarity of our communication, the fluidity and efficiency of our commerce. But it is becoming increasingly clear that they often come at a steep price. Yes, our lives may be more convenient, but are they more contented? Yes, we may be more efficient in the use of our time, but are we more relaxed? Yes, we may have more material wealth, but are we wealthy in spirit? And the answer to all of these questions is more and more audibly a resounding no. If anything, the average American is more anxious than she has ever been and leads a considerably more stressful life than did her parents. The average American laborer works more hours and takes less vacations than ever. The incidence of depression and other mental and emotional illnesses appears to be greater than ever. And in recent years, the overall health of the average American appears to be declining rather than improving, presumably as a consequence of these factors. Well, in the midst of this maelstrom of change, 
the message of this morning's gospel reading appears as a spiritual oasis and a beacon of hope. Abide in me, says our Lord. Abide in me, and I in you. This summons from Jesus calls us to step back and turn away from the myriad distractions of our tumultuous world and to immerse ourselves in the one reality that does not change, the reality of our risen, ascended, and reigning Lord Jesus, the incarnate Word of God and unique mediator between God and humanity. In this summons, we hear echoes of another summons. Come unto me, all ye who are weary, and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And we're reminded of our Lord's words to his disciple Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but only one thing is necessary. The call to abide, to continually dwell in Christ, is a call which the Holy Spirit continues to sound to both church and world today. For those who are far from Christ It comes as a song of hope, the strains of a heavenly melody promising healing for the brokenhearted, truth in a world of falsehood, and real love amid the broken promises of our culture of narcissism. But this call is principally for the church. Note that Jesus' call to abide in him is a call to those who are already in Christ, who are already branches on the vine. And as such, it sounds both as a promise And as a warning, as a promise, it reminds us of that reality which is foundational to our existence as Christians, the reality of our union with Christ. I am the vine, you are the branches, says our Lord. And for 2,000 years, Christians have understood this passage to refer to that mysterious union and participation we share with our Lord through the Holy Spirit. Accordingly, says Cyril of Alexandria, those united, anchored, and rooted in Christ who are already partakers in his nature through their participation in the Holy Spirit are branches. For we are begotten of him and in him, in the Spirit, in order to produce the fruits of life. Consequently, Jesus' call to abide in him is first and foremost a call to remain centered and rooted in the reality of our union with him, to rest in him and commune with him through the mediating presence of the Holy Spirit. As such, this abiding union serves as the foundation and fulcrum of our lives, the constant, unwavering still point at the center of the vortex of change that is our contemporary life, the wellspring of life that nourishes our weary souls and the secure place of refuge in the midst of the storm. But this call is also a call to grow deeper into him who has grafted our lives into his life. And as the Apostle Paul tells us to grow up in all things into the vine who is also our head, Jesus Christ. This abiding is not a static one, but a dynamic relationship that results in genuine growth and transformation. For the promise he gives to us is this, whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. But how does this growth, this fruit bearing take place? Well, mainly, simply by abiding, by remaining, by continually dwelling in and relying upon Christ. For it is Christ through the Holy Spirit who is the vine and who supplies us, the branches, with everything we need. If we remain in him, submitted to his will, dependent upon his grace, nourished by his love, over the years and decades, we will mature and we will bear fruit. The vine dresser would not let it be otherwise. He will tend us, he will prune us, And in doing so, he will see to our fruitfulness. So, says John Calvin, not only does Christ cleave to us by an indivisible bond of fellowship, but with a wonderful communion day by day, he grows more and more into one body with us until he becomes completely one with us. 
But surely we ask, surely we ought to be doing something. Shouldn't we be praying, reading our Bibles, meeting for fellowship and worship? Well, yes, of course, we should be doing these things insofar as they contribute to and deepen our abiding, our union and participation in Christ. But our Lord makes it clear in our passage, apart from me, you can do nothing. Consequently, we must never think that any amount of religious activity, no matter how disciplined or how passionate, can ever take the place of our fundamental union with Christ, a union that precedes and undergirds all of these efforts. In this regard, our Lord's call to abide in him also comes to the church as a warning. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. The branch cannot bear fruit by itself. Yet sometimes our religious activities appear to operate under the assumption that the branch, in fact, is fully capable of doing just that. And so we ramp up the number of church programs and church-sponsored events we host each month under the assumption that more is better and that increased participation in these activities will lead to greater spiritual maturity. But as Willow Creek's Reveal study demonstrated last year, this simply isn't the case. As such, the call to abide in Christ offers a word of warning and correction to the, to the propensity toward a restless, untempered activism that so often seems to typify our evangelical approach to the Christian life. Now, along these lines, and these are just examples, it seems to me that there are at least two identifiable movements within evangelicalism, and there are probably more that these will do, that would be well served to heed this warning. The first is commonly referred to as the missional church movement. And this movement, while an understandable reaction to the program-oriented church model I just described, nonetheless appears at times, by no means always, but at times, to run the risk of being driven by the same sort of evangelical activism, albeit in a different mode. While affirming the desire to take seriously Jesus' call to go into the world and make disciples of all nations, I confess my occasional alarm at some within this movement, not many, but some, who appear to have great confidence in their inherent ability to incarnate Christ, seemingly by their own efforts. And to the degree that this perception is accurate, this strikes me as a sure recipe for ministry burnout, at the very least, and ministry failure, at the very worst. Apart from me, says our Lord, you can do nothing. On the same note, but in a different key, I'm sometimes concerned by what I see within the burgeoning spiritual disciplines movement among some evangelicals, notwithstanding the fact that I'm an Anglican, an Anglican priest at that. At times, not always, but at times, what begins with the stated and admirable goal of spiritual formation appears to lose its focus and devolve into what amounts to a form of spiritual legalism, whereby the spiritual disciplines become an end in themselves rather than a means to the greater end of deeper union and participation with Christ. But this too seems to me to be a sure recipe for spiritual burnout and disillusionment. Apart from me, says our Lord, you can't do nothing. In both these cases, and I'm sure we could name other examples, I believe we see a basic assumption at work. Whether consciously or unconsciously, we believe that we, the branches, can bear fruit by ourselves. That we can affect change either in the lives of others or in our own lives through our own strategies and techniques. And to the extent that we do this, it seems to me that we veer dangerously close to Pelagianism. And if you don't know what that is, look it up. I'm a theologian, so you'll have to forgive me. And to ways of thinking and acting that establish new forms of Christian legalism. If and when we do this, we are no longer abiding in Christ, but are seeking to achieve spiritual goals apart from the power of the Spirit. And such efforts are ultimately doomed to falter and fade away because they are not rooted and established in Christ. Indeed, the tragic legacy of the liberal theological tradition is that in its quest for cultural relevance, let the reader understand, it abandoned the notion of a real union and participation in Christ and embraced a de facto Pelagianism. 
As a consequence, it now serves as the prime example of our Lord's words, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And if anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. The simple truth is this. It is God and God alone who changes human hearts and transforms human minds. No amount of service or mission, no amount of spiritual discipline, no proliferation of Habitat for Humanity projects, soup kitchens, evangelistic crusades, or even theological education can, by their own power or dint of persuasion, awaken or even turn the human heart to God. This alone is the sole purview and domain of the Holy Spirit. All our efforts and preparation, projects and planning are but attempts to create channels through which the Holy Spirit may move. But the Spirit blows where he wills, and it is not given to us to know when or how he will move in the life of even one person, let alone a generation. As the Apostle Paul says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. All of this brings us back to the question that we have yet to ask of our passage. What of the fruit? We've talked about abiding in Christ, but what is the fruit that will result from that abiding? Here in reply, these words from our passage. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. What is the fruit that results from abiding in Christ? Nothing more or less than the love and joy of God. Only the love and joy of God, that's all. Brothers and sisters, do you know how much our chaotic world yearns for the love and joy of God? for a real and true and firm foundation in the midst of the whirlwind? For that matter, do you yearn for the love and joy of God? If so, if you have even a glimpse of what the love and joy of God is, then you know how great a treasure we have in Christ. Theological paradigms and ministry movements will come and they will go. But the reality of our union with Christ, the reality of our participation in the life of the Godhead, and the reality of the transforming work of the Holy Spirit pouring out the love of God in our midst, that is the one constant gift that we, the church, have, have to offer the world. And the greatest wonder of all is that this reality is available to all who believe from the simplest, most impoverished, and least privileged Christian in the most remote corner of the globe, to the popes and patriarchs and PhDs that inhabit our centers of theolo theological knowledge and ecclesial power. And that, my friends, is the gospel. Every now and then we get a chance to witness a person whose life is suffused by the love and joy of God a person who has spent the greater part of their life abiding in Christ. Mother Teresa was one of those, I believe. But J. Christie Wilson, my missions professor at Gordon-Conwell, was a man I know for certain was one of these. Christie, as everyone called him, was a man who had for many years been seized by the love and joy of God such that everywhere he went and to every person he encountered, he shed abroad that love and joy like a beaming lantern. He was in his very person a living testimony to the love and joy of God. And though he has passed on now, those of us who are privileged to know him remember how, as one fellow alumnus put it so well, the sweet aroma of Christ was present simply because he was there. Isn't that great? Perhaps you've had the privilege of knowing such a person. Among the Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholics, and even among us Anglicans, we often refer to such people as saints, not because we aren't included among the saints, but because their lives stand as a living witness to the radiance of redeemed humanity 
suffused and incandescent with the love and joy of God. This is why such people are often portrayed in sacred art with halos about their heads, not because they were visibly luminous for the most part, but because they bore with them a palpable spiritual radiance that was nothing less than the sweet aroma of Christ, a glimmer of heaven glimpsed through the eyes of the Spirit. My friends, what our church and world need today is saints, men and women whose lives are steeped in the life of Christ and are radiant with his love and joy. More than programs or projects or principles, more than strategies and techniques, our world needs Christians who abide in Christ, whose lives bear the fruit of true spiritual maturity, who carry the gospel wherever they go simply by by virtue of their presence. I am convinced that if we were truly to abide in Christ as we are called to do, we would see a dramatic transformation of the church in America and a dramatic influx of new believers into that church. Yes, we need to seek and to serve those who are lost. And yes, we need to seek to renew the church But the root and foundation of all our seeking and service must be the one in whom we abide, such that all we do in him is shaped by his love and joy. Our world is in need of saints. Let us be among them. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You're watching WETN, a service of Wheaton College. For information on our programs, call 630-752-752. 5061 or email wetn at wheaton.edu. A video program guide is available at wetn.org.